thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. And I can't believe I'm following Dr. Ban. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope you all get out of, get out of this what we got out of that. That was amazing. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so you heard about me and what I do. Uh, my agency is a UX agency, and we do a lot of testing, prototyping, building, testing, messaging, stuff like that. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about what we do. Um, I want to talk about what we're going to talk about because it's good to know what you're getting into. But we're, I'm going to, I'm not totally sure who's in the room. I know that we have some engineers and some designers and some other roles in here, some owners and some thinkers. And um, so I'm really quickly going to walk through Agile method, talk a little bit about Scrum, talk a little bit about Waterfall, because I know they're all different things. And I'm going to entertain them, and all the developers in the room are going to get mad at me. But um, I'm going to talk about how we do our work and what we've screwed up and what we've learned from and how we do it better. And uh, the name of the game at our studio is all about efficiency and, um, and the goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we typically run a sprint in our using the Agile method, so a scrum sprint, and particularly how we do it based on our conditions at our agency. Um, we're going to talk about how what the pros and cons of running this are that we found out over the last, I think, four years of doing it. And then the title of this is what happened when we mixed in waterfall. Sometimes we have switched back to waterfall, and I'll tell you what conditions have to exist in order to do that and why we did it and how it worked out and, um, and how we think about our work, because it's very, very different than we used to think about it. Um, We'll talk about the conditions that had to exist in order for this work to do, and then talk a bit, little bit about how we've sort of redefined Agile for ourselves, which I'm sure I'll get a lot of. Uh... So um, our spirit animal at Limerite is Yoda. So we typically throw ourselves into a process and do everything we can to do it. We don't really dip our toes in first. We kind of fling ourselves full body into the pond. So at our agency is... There's a do or do not, there's no try. So here is a story of our not trying and doing <laughs> for over the last four years. So it, for the people who don't know what Agile Method, capital A, capital M are, these are the six principles of that. Um, define a measurable goal, which makes a lot of sense, right? Everyone on the team owns the problem. So it's not just a developer problem or a design problem or an owner's problem or a researcher's problem. It's everyone's hands in all the time. Um, you make small steps with visible impact, which is probably my favorite thing of Agile, which is you know, you're just making these little iterative changes and launching everything you, you know, and launching as you go. You're not trying to make a big dog and pony show like you would do with Waterfall, which I'll get into in a second. And you're going to validate and test everything that you do all the time. And I'll talk to you a little bit about, at the end, how we look at that differently now. Um, obviously, measure success and iterate. And I don't, I can't see, I'm going to watch Slack like off the corner of my eye. So if you have questions while I'm talking, please ask them. If, um, if I know the answer, I will say that I do. If I don't, we'll see if anybody else on Slack does. But um, so just conversely, Waterfall, which is how most we're, we started out being a design agency, and then we went very much into being develop, agent, developer agency. So when we started, this is what we did. We collect the requirements. We decide what we're going to do. We design it. We send it to a developer, or we build it ourselves. We test and QA and spend a month doing that. And then we maintain it, and we sell somebody you know, maintenance program, which is really the worst way ever to do anything, and it pisses everyone off. Um, unless you did what we did <laughs> and mixed them in together. Um, how This is a picture of our actual current wall. Um, so if you're not familiar with Scrum or sprinting, what we do is based on these principles of the Agile method, we run Scrum. And we used to run them in two week. We figured out that that wasn't working for us. So we stretched them out to three week. So in the very beginning, um, what you do is you define how you're going to be successful. We call it, It's called success criteria. And you define, based on a user's story, and it's all user centric, what are, what are, how will we know when we're done? How will we know when we've built or designed or wireframe or launched enough to get done? And that's a, a group facilitated meeting that everyone 
big, huge, long thing. It takes us about two and a half hours and it's a seven person meeting plus clients. And uh, it's this in this instance, it's Monday. And then we go into wireframing and we have a little pop up of, hey, are we are we doing this right? Do we have all the requirements? Does anything need to be adjusted? Um, are we going to be able to complete this within scope? And then we do a wireframe review with our client. We're in agencies. So we have clients. We're not just building one a piece of software. Um, and then we structure and style everything, review everything. And during this time, we're QAing all the front end. Then we build and style all the back end. We review it. And then we review and test. And during this revisions testing QA bar at the bottom is a bunch of training. So we're training our whole team on the system. We're also training our clients on how to enter content or how to um, do the things that they would do in their job every day. And then we, at the end of it, we have a retro, which is a meeting where you look at historically what went well, what didn't go well, what can we improve doing this. So this is basically the skeletal structure of how we've been building everything we've been building for the last like three or four years. Um, and uh, and just to give you a little sense of the shape of our agency, because a lot of times when we read about Agile, the problem we have with it was is that it's very much built for a product team who's building one product. Um, or. Uh, and, but we, are ha we have about 10 to 12 clients at any time, and we're building about four to five to six builds at any time. And we have a pretty small team of six people and about six dev freelancers um, and then some dev partners. So we, um, uh, we also use Slack, Teamwork, Pivotal Tracker, and Google Docs to manage all. This is a picture of our, our whiteboard with all of our jobs and sprints kind of staggered out. Um, so we've been trying, we've been doing this since 2003 in order, in the name of being a very efficient, energy efficient, streamlined B Corp at UX agency that builds really smart technology because of the guiding principles of being a B Corp, which is we're, we're very much interested in conserving energy. We're big fans of Tim Frick and Mighty Bytes who are down the street from us, and we absolutely adore them. We read everything that they do. Shout out to Tim. Hi, Tim. He's next. And, um, and we're trying the most predictable, most beneficial, most impactful system that we can. So looking at Agile, we were like, well, theoretically, this is definitely the thing that we should be doing. So let me give you a little history of of when we started implementing this Agile method or Scrum or these things, we went from very much a designer-centric process to a very developer-centric process, which was so good to do because we really decide, we, we all started to weigh our roles differently and look at each other as a, inner, as a very interconnected team. And it wasn't one person handing something else off to another person. And m in terms of just, the culture of the organization, everything shifted. It shifted from the design lead to a dev lead, which was really interesting and really different to see how my team moved and how lately, in the last about year and a half, we've shifted it because there are lots of issues with being developer centric to being user centric. Just and then even in the last six months, the to being organization, everything shifted. It shifted from the Whoa, design lead getting to a crazy loop. Um, we're getting a Sorry, I got a crazy loop. I heard myself in my ears. Um, but I got, we went to being user centric to being very much business and team centric. So when we're looking at the agile method overall, we're applying it not just to our business, but to how we operate as a team, how we interact with clients and, and how we develop products for them. So it's been a, a definite shift and it's been a lot more efficient. One of the biggest things that happened when we shifted was we had to question the idea of our, our roles in the team and how we operate, which was a really eye-opening experience for us to do. So here's a, a overall of, this is a typical team. I have a project manager, a front-end person, UX researcher, back-end owner, owner's me, strategy lead, and creative UX lead. In, when we were running Scrum, you know, everyone would come there with their specific job role or their specific tasks that they had to do. And a lot of times it's competitive or it wasn't totally clear what part of that Agile method, since everyone owns the problem, it wasn't quite clear who owns what part of that problem. Like we all had our very specific job titles, but 
you know, UX researcher and strategy would overlap. Creative would overlap with front end all the time. Front end would overlap with back end. And then I'm seeing the whole thing and, and harping on my PM to get this project done on time. So what we did was we realized we really had to clarify who we advocate for. So we redefined our roles. And the role here is the project advocate of the project and the budget. So the front end, Laura, my front end developer, is the advocate of the quality of the project or the product. And these roles, you can read the rest of them. Um, my job is to advocate for the relationship between my staff and between my company and our client companies. So I'm going to make decisions based on the thing that I advocate for more than like getting all upset about the project and the budget and the timeline or something's going on because that's really Annie's job is the project manager to advocate for the project in the budget. So interestingly, a lot of times some of these um, are at odds with each other, but we come to a problem and we approach it from a very specific advocacy thought, which it aligns a lot with the kind of work that we do, all in social mission and mission-based work. And our clients really understand what's going on. My favorite one is the back end is the um, advocate of the reality. Because a lot of the time, the rest of us are dreamers and we like to come up with things. But our back end developer will come in and say, you know, let's just talk about what's really possible and executable in these next three weeks. Because we don't have all the time in the world. And we are very much um, limited by the constraints of time and dollars. So this, do, going through this process and defining what everyone advocates for was probably the best thing we've done in the last year. It has, um, so we've re rebuilt our roles. And now when we do this, we also approach all of the business of the business with these roles, not just the whatever project we're working on. And the other thing that happened was, uh, as we were doing Agile, that any Anybody totally in the game or didn't drink our Kool-Aid had to go. So I, I lost a few employees and I fired a few because we had to, being efficient and working lockstep as a team had such a big uh, dependency on who was actually on board. I also had to let some clients go because they um, were not on board. Because the goal ultimately for to get any kind of development work to, to move quickly and efficiently is trust. Trust between our team, trust between our clients, trust that I have a I can actually do my job and and I can lead the team. So as we've been running this, setting these conditions and these roles and uh, running agile, or running based on the agile method, I'm doing that just to make all the developers happy. We the pros have been that we have had our time together, which conversely means we have a lot more and we have a lot of time. So we have these really expensive seven, eight person meetings um, for two or so hours. We're voting, we're doing acceptance criteria, we're running through all the stories and rolling up to all the epics. And um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of time. We're definitely communicating a lot better, but it takes a lot of time to be fast and timely and things need to be more efficient and, and immediate. So it is kind of a time suck and people seem to bounce back and forth a lot more than they used to. Um, because they're not sitting in a, you know, in a dark room designing a whole website, you know, you have to work as a team and test and look at things and go through an iteration. There are, we've had no surprises on budget and timing, which probably was my most uh, driving factor for moving to this method. Because we are talking about timing and budget all the time, and because um, Annie, who is the advocate of the project and the budget, that is really her perspective for everything she does. So that is infused to everything she talks about with our clients and with our staff. So we're extremely well versed on where we are, what we have left, what we're going to have to sacrifice, or if we're going to have to ask for more money. But there is the converse of that is the increased project management time documentation. So it does add to that. So it's, you know, running this isn't always the most efficient, but the product has been a lot better. So it's definitely worth it. We have increased margins on our projects because what I was doing before when we were running Waterfall or in like a shaky version of, of Scrum was that I, if I overcommitted some kind of feature, I would hire a developer to do it and just get it done to make my client happy and to take the load off my team. And I would absorb that cost a lot of time, which isn't the best business decision. But as the advocate of the relationship, I really want to preserve that. And I didn't want to have to charge someone for something that was maybe our fault for not 
a scoping correctly or over committing. This way, we're, we don't have any of that anymore. And I've also restructured how I do my freelance costs and billing, so yay for me. But we do see a decrease in the overall productivity because people are running these lockstep three-week processes and there is downtime based on your role. So we, we're trying to find ways to fill that time in. Um, one of the ways that we've been able to do that has been to stagger the times that the scrum actually starts. So and they don't all start Monday or else we'd have uh, a 12 hour meeting day, which is not humanly possible. So we stagger them, we do Monday, Wednesday, and then we stagger them week to week. So that has been helping a little bit, but you know, we didn't know that once we started doing that and decided to, uh, to run this in a different process. Um, the big bonus to doing, to doing this this way is that the quality of the work went way up and it's more efficient and we can measure everything which if I'm going to try to and a lot of the work we do is not e-commerce it's a lot of service-based stuff and it's a lot of nonprofit social impact so if we're going to try to measure that um, this is a huge gateway and it gets our clients really versed in how we do that um, and how to do that when we turn the keys over and it's more in their hands we're currently developing an MVP for a startup and we have I think six or seven sprints and the seventh sprint is was just for technical debt so we were thinking like okay everything we can't execute we're just gonna roll into sprint seven make a backlog just for that one and roll everything out but since we've been operating this way we don't have any technical debt which is crazy I don't think we've ever had a project where we didn't have any technical debt so now we can spend the time to we still have a little bit of budget left, which is amazing. And we're either going to turn that back to our client and say, hey, we totally came in under budget, or, or what was probably more likely is that we'll spend it on more brand enhancement, interaction enhancement, and a little bit more marketing instead of just building out the features that we need to hit MVP, which is really, really exciting and different. So I know I've talked a lot about how great Scrum is, but let me talk a little bit about how when we switched to waterfall it was scary because we felt like we were going back in time and it was also great because uh, we hit our deadline and we made everybody happy so we we're we're running this project I'll tell you this story about so our about this project we were running which hold on my headset just kind of did something weird all right so the goals of this project where we did switch back to waterfall was to keep the process iterative and streamlined. So we wanted to be, is we were running a, we were doing a website for a nonprofit. We weren't building software. We wanted to prioritize the components and features that hit the bottom line first, which is almost always how we run this. We wanted to keep the team really, really small. And we wanted to train the client as part of every sprint so that we could offload a ton of work to them because we didn't have a ton of time. So we wanted to make sure we were focused on the things we were building and, um, and not doing like content entry or something that they could end up taking over. So I wanted, these are the conditions that had to exist in order for this thing to be successful, but the, it was a web build, so it wasn't a software, it wasn't an app, it wasn't an MVP. Um, we, had, uh, we had done discovery, DC for dev sprints plus launch is my shorthand for, we did a discovery, we did a concept, we did four dev sprints, and we had a launch. So this is our plan. Um, we didn't have any extra budget. We couldn't ask for more money. We had anything we were going to go over, I was going to eat probably. So we didn't want to do that. Um, so also the conditions in this job that made Waterfall possible was we had had a long-term history with this client and we really, they really were in love with each other. We started the build with Scrum. So our client knew how hard d these decisions we were making were and how complicated they are. They also were hands-on the process the whole time. So there was no dog and pony show. We were definitely doing this collaborative decision-making process. So in the upfront, a small team, it did add to project time because we had to talk through everything with them and we had to make sure that they understood everything. We had also done enough discovery but just enough discovery. So we didn't spend a ton of time doing a ton of research. We did enough to get us started and to understand the landscape and get us some good fuel for how do we prioritize these features that'll help them raise more money, get more donations, get more eyeballs on their newsletter, you know, the things that they wanna do. We also had a very, very small team internally at my office. We only had three people on this project. 
again, I was trying to keep this thing really lean and really small. And we were at the end of the project. If we had started to try to, um, if we had started out doing waterfall, which would collect requirements, design a whole, all the whole website, and then build it and try to get approvals and content, it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked because they wouldn't have trusted that we were able to make these technical decisions. They wouldn't have felt like they were be they were being listened to, and they would really wouldn't have felt like they had business input on what was priority and what. Um, so, in order for this disaster to not happen. We had to have these conditions possible. So, what we had, what we ended up doing was, we had uh, run through two or three sprints, and we realized that we were running out of time. And we knew that if we had, we kept doing the sprint structure with two or two and a half or two to two three week long sprints, we would have gone way over time. So we did, we said, listen, client, we love you, you love us, everything's wonderful. We're going, we want to execute everything that you have left on your wish list. Here's how we're going to do that. We're going to just design everything, and we're going to put it up on your site, and we're not going to have a whole bunch of meetings, and we're not going to ask for all your input, and we're going to streamline all of our processes, and we're going to come to you in three weeks, and we're going to show you the rest of your site. How does that sound? And they said, okay because they knew that we had proven ourselves over and over in the beginning. They knew how hard the decisions were, knew how to manage the site because we had trained them as we were building, and they knew that uh, our team was capable of making really good decisions in their interest because we had redefined our roles to advocate for them. And that was really the only way that Waterfall made any sense. And we ended up delivering the product on under time and um, exactly how they wanted, and they're still one of our most favorite people in the whole world. Um, so, you know, I said in the very beginning that we use this Agile framework to run our own business, and it's it's not just about running our projects, it's about being iterative and measurable and testing um, and everyone owning the problem in our actual company. So we've taken that model because it makes so much sense and it really does eliminate uncertainty, which in my life, I think that's the only thing I'm ever after is eliminating uncertainty. So when we looked at the original six, you know, uh, agile principles here, we've re redefined them. These, these orange rules, these orange words are the words that um, we've added based on what we've done over time. And, and now everyone's going to I know, I know I'm I'm redefining agile method holy shit but he, let's say it's not just important to to define a measurable goal but is the as the advocate of reality my back end developer would say we want to define an attainable goal something that we can actually execute in 2 weeks within our budget and within our timeline and something that if we're training our clients they have the capacity to actually do which to me is a really big important thing um everyone does own the problem but they own the problem based on what they advocate for. Because if we're all trying to solve the same problems all the time, over and over, we're not scalable, and we step on each other's toes. And this way, we all know that we're all equal, there's no hierarchy, and we advocate for different parts of the project and different parts of the business. And making small steps with visible impact is probably my favorite thing. I think that's the most important there is everyone needs to understand, number one, the motivations of those small steps, and everyone needs to understand the technical implications of those small steps. So, for example, the reason why we train our clients, or, you know, I have kind of an open books policy here, is that everyone understands the functioning of the business, why I would make a decision for the relationship of a client, or why someone would make a, a feature poll or would not make or would make a feature for an MVP. It's the same theory. And validating with our target audience, we're big fans of that, but we're also big fans of not going over budget. So uh, what we like to do is in the way that makes the most sense based on capacity, timeline, and budget. So that means if I have a question, I might not do a huge quantitative study every sprint because that would be crazy town, but I might pick up the phone and call somebody who is in our target market and ask them to run through something with me. Or I might do a quick heat map or something that's, that costs almost no money that gets me the results that I want. So again, we're being very flexible and responsive based on what we're trying to find out. 
And point five is maybe the most important part of all of this besides number two, which is we have to define what success looks like in order to measure it, which is, means is obvious. But I, uh, I wrote a blog post last year or last January about a blog post that I wrote about last year, which is hilarious. But I had uh, set all these goals for my business and I had failed to meet them miserably. I really, really hilariously went not even anywhere near it because I hadn't defined it. I hadn't set expectations correctly and they definitely weren't attainable. They were measurable, but they definitely weren't attainable. So in, in all things in terms of business or anything in terms of a relationship or anything in terms of a, building a product, defining that success is incredibly important. And also when we reflect and adjust and iterate in our in our scrum in our two week or in our three week sprints is one thing, but we're not just doing that for the product. We're looking at the health of our relationship, which is directly resulting in the health of our business, the health of the project, and the health of the user. So it's a it's a very holistic look at how do we iterate to make ourselves a better team, the relationship with our clients better. How do we iterate to make the relationship with their users better and to make the community better as a whole? And, and I think that if you take this methodology and apply it to um, our, a business or a sustainable system or a nonprofit or something like that, really the way that you execute that could be some kind of scrum or it could be some kind of waterfall. But as long as you have this, these principles down, it, it can work really well. And, um, and not have an audience asking me questions, but that's my whole presentation. Woohoo! I have a couple minutes for questions. If you guys have any, I'm looking at Slack right now, but um, I don't see any. So if I can help you, I'd love to. Awesome, Emily. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, let's look at Slack together and see if there are any incoming questions. Uh, yeah, I was, I uh, you know, I've, I've very much of the camp of scoffing at the very mention of waterfalls. So that was very illuminating right? for me. You know, it's. Uh, I was like, oh, we have to, to get to, to innovate. We have to go back to the beginning. I love it. It's uh, thank you so much. Yeah, for, it was for wild. It still feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels weird. And for me, it's like, well, how does this track overall? Well, reduce, reuse, reuse and recycle. And mm -hmm. I think you were showing pretty clearly this is the best way to do the reduce bit in terms of reducing oh, waste yes. effort. Um, that's all, the name of the game always is reducing that a waste and yeah. effort. We d yeah. and that's, Redu you know, reduce first before you get to the, the reuse and the recycle bits. Of exactly. Um, yep, it's fun. Horrifying to our team, but fun. <laughs> 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 no, it was a good time. And really, though, the trust is the only thing. If that hadn't happened, I mean, if that, that hadn't existed, it, the whole thing would have fallen apart. So thankfully, we had an amazing client and a great team to do that. Super. I see uh, you're getting, starting to get some questions there in the general oh. channel on Slack. How do you communicate this stuff? Like? Oh, hey, Tim. <laughs> oh, well, it's it's very much like a like getting into a pool. <laughs> we when I'm first talking to clients, sorry, I don't, can, can you read the question? Because the, uh, the audience. Says, oh, it says, it. how do you communicate this stuff so that it's easy for clients to understand? Well, I uh, I don't. Like I don't use jargon, and I can because I I know that everyone here kind of knows the words. But we don't try to sell people on a method or say like, well, your epics are going to be so great, or you know, they would they would be like, I don't, I think this is a foreign language. So we do it in in little chunks. You know, we have a we have a charter, very first thing, and we introduce some of the concepts. We send a glossary. We review it with them. We we work everything we do is so hands on and not just delivered to them that they learn the vocabulary and learn how things go. So they're sitting in a sprint planning meeting and voting on complexity, you know, after an hour of sitting in a meeting voting on complexity. Like they understand the concepts of it, and then we add the words to it, and then they. So I guess it's kind of an iterative debut, even because by the end of it, they're all jargony and they think they're awesome, and they are awesome, and it's so exciting to see it, but. We try to do it in really small batches and uh, kind of as, as slowly as it takes us to really fully understand what they do, it takes about the same amount of time for them to understand what we do. So hopefully by, you know, sprint two, we're pretty, 
set and going. And the first sprint we do is always the same sprint. It's always the same uh, pages, the same things, the same features, the same deliverables, every first sprint. So we can do it in our sleep. And the clients, it's that's our first experience with it. So good for everyone. And I got a, I really like the advocate model. Yeah, that was something we cooked up and it's been, uh, it's been the best thing we ever did was to figure out who advocates for what in the company. It's changed how we talk to each other. It's really good. That line about the um, the back end being the advocate for reality, we're totally <laughs> stealing that. And um, I, I sit yeah. with the back end folks at, and at our agency. I feel, I feel that keeps my UX work honest and they're going to love that. Yeah, they Actually, really it are. Their heads. It might go to their heads. That's the problem. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, but that's good because they're really smart. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Cool. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Cool. No, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, looks like that's it for questions. So we will let you go. I'll give you another round of applause there, much deserved. Um, and then we have a few minutes now until